Welcome to another Dragonlance Saga review episode. It is Bakukul Brook Green the 18th. My name's Adam, and today I'm giving you my spoiler review of The Soul Forge by Margaret Weiss. Now there's another Soul Forge gaming book, and there's the Test of the Twins short story, but this is the definitive edition <laughs> of Raceland's Test. Not the best though, but we're gonna get into it. All right, so, uh, I will be spoiling this story, so if you don't want to know it, or you haven't read it yet, and you want to go in to be surprised about a character that's been around since the late 80s, don't watch this. <laughs> if you're like every other Dragonlance fan on the planet, and you already know every in and out of this character, then welcome! Come on into the YouTube chat, and let's, let's sort of geek out a little bit. It's Friday. We got nothing else going well, I have nothing else going on. I don't want to presume. Let's have some fun, right? I'm sitting here with some Cabernet Sauvignon. I've got a great book I'm going to talk about. Some parts that kind of bug me. So it's going to be a good conversation. Now, the way these things shake out is that I'm going to give you my pre-written review. And then at the end, any comments or questions that you want to throw up or talk amongst yourselves in the chat between people watching, uh, I will address after the fact, give you any other additional thoughts and notes on whatever it is that you guys are talking about. And we'll just sort of have a little bit of a back and forth, a little banter. It'll be a lot of fun. So thank you guys so much. Can I just say really quick, Anthony in the chat, I hear you, man. Tannis is a badass. I dig him myself. Um, I feel like if, if we don't understand Raceland or at least identify with some portion of him, then we're just not humans. Because honestly, Raceland Majir is the amalgamation of every human experience ever, right? Like everything. So at least something has to resonate with you or else you're a robot. That's just <laughs> that's how it works. Uh, you know, machine. Thanks for joining live. It's great to see you. David, how you doing? Thanks for tuning in live. Spoiling is happening. <laughs> it's coming. IPA, nice. I used to brew some IPAs, and I would do an IPA with a citrus hop as the dry hop, so you'd get this really great nose of citrus with the IPA, but you would still get the traditional, like, real super hoppy, you know, you wouldn't get the orange flavor from the hop, you'd just get the nose from it. It made for a really interesting beer experience. Marcos, good to see you. Thanks for joining live. Yeah, well, I don't know. that We're going to get into that. That's an interesting point. So Marco says that he remembers this being a slow one. Um, I can definitely see your point, but I personally don't mind a slow burn. I think that's where you get all of your character development, whether it's a film, a TV series, a novel, an article, whatever. So I don't, I don't mind him personally. I think there was a ton of character development for specifically Raceland and everyone else, but we're going to get into it. So thank you so much, so much for tuning in live. I would like to take a moment and thank the members of this YouTube channel and invite you to consider becoming a member by visiting the links in the description below and remind you that you can always pick up Dragonlance gaming materials by using the affiliate link. All of this goes to help out the channel and I really do appreciate you. Again, this is my perspective only. If you have any thoughts or you disagree with mine, I welcome you to share them in the YouTube chat because chances are you're not the only one and it's always great to talk with other Dragonlance fans. So the forum is here. Let's have some fun. Book one can be seen as an introduction to Antimides, a white-robed magician who travels the land and acts as a sort of information gatherer for the Orders of High Sorcery. He reports his findings to Parsalian, the head of the Orders, and it is on one such journey where he enters Solace and meets Kitiara. She recognizes him as a mage right off the bat, and as he heads up to the end of the last home for dinner, she decides to confront him during dinner about being a mage. She tells him that she has a brother who is interested in magic, and Kit asks uh, Antimides to talk to him out of it. She runs off to find Raceland, much to Antimides' consternation, and presents him. Now, Antimides is touched by his patron deity as he is talking to Raceland, as one of his tasks is to identify would-be students in magic. He's taken in by Raceland, and even bothered slightly by his personality. But he and his god are certain that this is, in fact, a potential mage, and he decides to pay for Raceland's tutelage in Master Theobald's Sorcerer Academy nearby. Antimides sees the state of neglect in Raceland and understands that Kit just wants to leave her brothers, 
but she can't until she's convinced that they can take care of themselves. Shortly after Raceland is accepted into the school, she then ends up leaving them. I want to bring up a, a really quick note here because the way that we read this novel, we it's presented in a way that Raceland is extraordinary from beginning. The gods are literally tapping their hands on the gods of magic, are tapping their hands on the back of Antimides, Antimides saying, look, this guy is someone you need to pay attention to. Don't let him out of your grasp. Now, whether that happens to every single student of magic, and that just happens to be the way that he discovers it, is left unknown to us. Because it is put in a position where we don't know what normally happens, so we can only assume that because we know where Raceland ends up, this must be an out-of-the-ordinary experience. But there's a couple experiences like this that Raceland has that I can't help but think we project them to be special because we want Raceland to be so special, but the truth is probably they all have this, these experiences. So we'll get into that a little bit more, but I just want to sort of lay a, a groundwork of, I don't think Raceland is as special as everyone thinks he is. In fact, I think he's a little worse than most people want him to be. But because of circumstances, he ended up being greater. That's just my hot take. Okay. Raceland takes to the school well, though he lacks perspective and respect. He is bullied by the other bolds, boys, and even Theobald, who, in all fairness, bullies all the boys. Theobald knows deep down that Raceland is talented, and this is threatening to his ego. Now, we got that a lot from DL5 and the In the Last Home source books that were very clear that Raceland was a huge threat to Theobald. Not as much in this story, which I thought was really interesting. He was annoyed more than he was, like he just didn't feel like he deserved it more than, you know, he was threatened by him. But I threw that in there because I'm, I'm sort of wrapping all of the mythology together because this book is the version of all the mythologies thrown together. Okay. So book two focused on Raceland's time returning home during school break and feeling out of place at home as if he were still an outsider. Ultimately, he accepts that it was himself who placed him there as the outsider. Uh, his mother, Rosamund, is being helped by a, this new woman in their lives who believes in this new god and was seemingly taking really good care of her, though Raceland doesn't really trust her. They would work uh, on the house and go on walks together, effectively breathing life back into Rosamund. Now, Rosamund, as a character, was really fleshed out by Antimides, like, for me as a reader. I'd always had these weird imaginings of, of, because again, I'm reading the version of Raceland's youth from DL5 and um, the original module, DL5, uh, Dragons of Mystery, and the In the Last Home source book, which is the first of those source books to be released. And it's a different history. It is a different childhood. So you got to understand that. So when I come into this and I hear about Rosamund, I'm immediately thinking that she is... Um, if not a, a sort of a psychic, she has psionic powers in some way. She can foretell, foresee the future. But in this story, it's actually framed as she is actually really talented in magic, but she was never shown how to do it. And so the magic is actually taking over her mind because she doesn't know what to do or how to control it. It's a much more interesting take on the character. And it actually explains a lot more the importance of magic users going around and trying to find youth that are touched by this, this uh, addiction to magic. Because if they don't, they could end up like Rosamund. And I like that idea a lot more. Magic is, it's a drug that will drive you insane if you don't know how to uh, effectively harness it. It is a very different perspective than I've had outside of this book. So I thought it was really cool. Raceland saw how his brother had grown up strong and become much stronger. His interest in girls was growing, and he tried to get Raceland to be interested as well, but he clearly isn't. When Raceland was packing to return uh, to school, his mother ended up freaking out about it. Apparently, she no longer wants her son to be a mage. This is unspoken, but clearly an influence from her helper. She, you know, at one time, the talents that she exhibited, Raceland was mimicking through his obsession with magic. And then now, out of nowhere, she doesn't want him to go? It's pretty clear why. 
So back at school, Raceland is finally invited to take this initial magic test and is terrified that he's going to fail. He prayed to the three gods of magic and they actually appeared to him, making a deal for him to worship them and never denying their presence and he would feel the magic. Now, this makes me wonder if it weren't for that bargain, would Raceland have any magic at all? Or was this simply a symbolic experience that all mages experience? Or is it very special to Raceland? And this is another one of those moments that I was talking about early on in this conversation where, you know, we think Raceland's special, but is that just because we're getting it through his story? Like, the truth is, is why would the three gods of Kryn, the, I'm sorry, the three gods of magic, approach one student and say, hey, if you want some magic, you got to uh, you got to believe and proselytize on our behalf. Otherwise, you ain't getting shit. And then do, like, does everyone do that? And then why didn't they strip him of magic when he stopped worshiping them and he sort of challenged all the other gods? If all of his magic is granted solely by the gods and he only has it because of them, how could the, he then challenge the gods? It's impossible. They would just remove the magic from him. So clearly that's not the case, or this is clearly not very thought out. And in either case, that's really frustrating as a reader, because we're presented with this world where the only way that you can use magic is by becoming an order, you know, a member of this order, but then that's not even true because there are renegades. So then if there are renegades who can use the magic without swearing fealty, and Raceland couldn't use magic until he swore fealty. Does he even have magic at all? Is he special in any way at all? That's what I was running through my head. Okay. Book three is a turning point for Karaman and Raceland. They learn of their father's accident, and as a whole town was standing uh, around him, Rosamond and Judith were preaching that Belzor would heal him, while Flint and the others dismissed it as nonsense. Karaman was beside himself, and Raceland was doing his best to get his mother home. Then, Gillen died, and Judith blamed the Majir family for his wickedness. Uh, for their wickedness, and that's why Gillen died. She demanded that they get cast out of Solace, but Tannis and Odic stepped up and told her that she should probably leave. <laughs> we, at, in Solace, take care of our own. It wasn't long after that that Rosamond fell into a trance and sort of wasted away uh, until her death. So it makes me wonder, does Rosamond need constant distraction in order to prevent herself from falling into these trances? And that's why when uh, the widow Judith was around, she didn't suffer from that? Or was she getting something off of Judith? Now, we know later what Judith actually is, and we'll get into that in a second. So was Judith using something in order to stave it off? I think it's an interesting thought to have. So on the day of her burial, Kidiara actually ended up coming home, and Raceland fell into a deep sickness. It was Kidiara's fighting for Raceland's life as she did when he was a baby that ended up saving him. I love the juxtaposition of this moment with what happens later in the book. Because Kidiara, she's such a complex character. On one hand, she is fighting for her little brother's life as an infant. Then when she returns home at her parents' death, she fights for his life as a young adult. And then later tries to get rid of him. <laughs> Where is this character's head at? It doesn't make any sense at all. Like either she really loves him and she's just sort of struggling with the idea of how to use him in her life. Or she really doesn't care at all. But you can't have both. You, it's got to be one or the other. I don't know. It didn't land quite well with me. Um... Let's see. Um, Kit offered Karaman and Raceland the chance to return to Sanction with her and become wealthy and powerful as mercenaries. They ended up refusing as Raceland simply wasn't ready with his magic and Karaman would never go anywhere without Raceland. So Kit left for Quilinesty in the middle of the night and the twins decided to stay and live by themselves. We see the split between the twins and Kit, as well as the continued fear and doubt of Raceland about his magic. 
He did cast sleep on Karaman successfully, so he feels like he's well on his way to learning magic, but he's still really self-conscious about it. Book four is focused on the Infellows, how they meet each other and interact and become friends. We see this dynamic between Kit and Tannis, Taz and Flint, Karaman and Sturm, etc. It's really refreshing to see them all together again, and though it's been around 30 years or more since I'd read the Meeting Sextet in the Preludes novels, it was really nice revisiting pieces of them as referenced in this book. The novel is titled The Soul Forge, which ultimately is about Raceland becoming a mage, but we readers, all we really want is to read about his test, which is widely held, or I'm sorry, wisely held until the very final book in this novel. Frustration aside, it is eased with an engaging storyline that finishes out Widow Judith's story arc. So you can argue that the entire first nine-tenths of this novel, the first five books of this novel, is about Raceland forging his soul with magic and Judith forging her soul as a, a huckster. Because as soon as those two get to their full authority, that's when they face off, and we actually get to see Raceland manifest as the powerful, eh, you know, whatever level he might be, um, effective magic user that he is. You know, he's supported by all the infellows as well, so that just, you know, adds to his success. But I do find it interesting that this story is less about Raceland and more about Raceland and all the people connected with him tangentially. So Widow Judith is a stepping stone for Raceland. Uh, the widow, <laughs> Widow Judith, moved on to Haven and started a temple to Belzor there. She was performing a minor magic trick as she was, in fact, a renegade wizard posing as a priest. It was her magical miracles that drew believers as she built them out of their money. I was really reminded of the film Nightmare Alley here. Now, Raceland takes it upon himself to stop her, not as revenge against her, but for a random grief-stricken mother and his own renown. It was incredibly touching to see how Raceland connected emotionally with this woman and reminded me about why people love this character. Raceland is nothing if not multidimensional. This is the strength of any good character, yet so few are developed quite as complex as Raceland. It's a testament to Weiss's writing. Anyway, Kit ends up killing Judith after Raceland exposes her as a fraud, then Raceland is jailed as her murderer because he was stupid enough to pick up the knife. Now, he was picking it up to try to probably shield his sister, but his sister doesn't give a fuck about him. Like, it's... Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to swear. <laughs> um, she doesn't care at all about him, which is really frustrating because if she didn't care, why did she save his life twice? Like, it doesn't make sense to me. It just doesn't mesh. Okay. Um, his friends and a kindly local mage named Lemuel that Raceland connected with in Haven rescue him, and Lemuel ended up giving Raceland his father's wrist knife and low-level war wizard spell books, much to Raceland's delight. Now, Raceland is much like Magus, um, uh, Magus, in that he wears all of the robes of the Order. Right now, he's wearing white because of his instructor's chosen order, but then he does end up wearing red and then ultimately going to black. He even ends up with Magus's staff, which may be an afterthought in the writing, but it really does showcase Raceland as a, a being beyond the Order, like Magus was, as he places himself in the Legends trilogy especially. It also is really nice to see Kitiara with the companions and see how well they all got on, knowing that this is really the calm before the storm and where everyone ends up. It's nice seeing the act of foreshadowing happen in real time as you read this. Now, there's also a fair amount of irony that Raceland's getting rid of Judith and the Belzor religion created an opening for the Seeker religion and was even thanked by Hedrick the High Theocrat. And it was the Seeker religion that ended up siding with the dragon armies that caused Solace to burn down. Like, it's crazy that he ends up helping the very religion to thrive that is ultimately the downfall of his home. Ironic. Okay, book five is short and sweet goodbye. It sees Raceland receiving his invitation to take the test of high sorcery, Sturm's mother passing, and the infellows deciding to go their separate ways. Everyone seems to be returning to their homelands, save for Raceland and Karaman, who are secretly headed to Weyrath Forest, and Kitty Ara is headed to work for the dragon armies as a mercenary. 
She and Tana split, and though we know what happens, it's still a painful separation. I found myself growing out of friendships in my life, and it's always a bittersweet experience, and it's always a bit painful. But those friendships where you don't speak for months or years, and then when you're back together, it's just like old times, those are rare and beautiful. And I have a few of those friendships, and I feel very fortunate to have them. This book really, um, book five in the novel, where they all decide to separate and rejoin after five years, we knew that from the very first novel ever written, Dragon's Autumn Twilight. But seeing it happen, like reading it happen in real time, it, it just really, it really instills into the reader how much these characters really did love each other. Even Kidiara how much they genuinely cared for each other. They all had their own ambitions and wants and dreams, but you run across people in life that you just connect with. You may not always get along with them. Sometimes you may want to harm them, <laughs> but you connect with them on some level. And it's those human connections that really mean everything in life. Like literally they are everything. Money is something we made up as a species survival is all that really matters because life is the only thing that we have. And so the connections you make in life are literally the most important things that you could ever experience. It's just nice seeing these different characters whom we've grown to love, see them succeed and become heroes and then die in most cases. Um, I don't know. There's something beautiful about it. It's very human. Book six is what we all bought this book for. And to be honest, I was a bit let down. Now, Raceland and Karaman arrive at the Tower of High Sorcery, and Raceland is given his test, which consists of him joining three Dark Elves to rob his friend Lemuel in Haven. He goes into the cellar, and Fist and Danalus shows up, telling Raceland that he fell into his trap, and he will die by the Dark Elves and the Orders of High Sorcery now that he's talking to him. Raceland learns that who he is, and what he wants and agrees to let Fisty help him. Raceland's golden skin ends up being a form of armor that protects him from the Dark Elves' fireball, but nothing else. That was the weirdest turn of events of this entire novel for me. If you want to explain why he has golden skin and have it be a result of the test at the Order of High Sorcery, awesome! But to say that it's armor, but it only worked once? and he still has to wear it the rest of his life, is lazy. It's ridiculous. And that's coming from someone who talks about fantasy nearly every day of his life. Like, come on. All right. So, so um, he ends up casting a magic missile, which grows into a much more powerful version of the spell, as if Fistadanalus cast it himself, which ends up killing the two, two of the three Dark Elves. Then, Raceland finds himself in the Hall of the Tower and is attacked by a third Dark Elf, who is cut by a dagger laced with poison, but he ends up killing the elf with it. Up until now, this is the Test of the High Sorcery, like someone who has never thought about how to run a Test of High Sorcery would write it. It is the worst. Like, if I experienced this Test of High Sorcery, I'd be pissed and feel like I was gypped. Like, I wasted my time playing through this. He cast two spells. Two. You can count them. It was so ridiculous. It, it's like if your DM wants to make sure that you will not ever die, that you will always be protected, and he doesn't really want to put in the effort to give a good story, this is what he would give you as a test. So frustrating. So Karaman shows up and offers help. Then Fist and Daniels appears and Karaman destroys him with two lightning bolts. Raced is pissed and ends up killing Karaman with burning hands. That's the second spell. Then Fist and Daniels appears again and Raceland says that you can have my life, but you're going to work for me. This is such a letdown in terms of storytelling. Parsalin reveals that he gave Raceland the hourglass eyes of the sorceress Raylana which is weird. Like, why would he give you someone else's eyeballs? That's just... Why, why does that have to be the thing? Why... Like, and even if it's not... <laughs> like, he took out Raceland's eyeballs and put in someone else's, which is kind of the phrasing. Even if it's just like, no, that's a curse that I had just imparted. It just happens to be a curse that someone else wrote. You know, like, Bigby's giant hand and Bigby's the guy that wrote the spell. Um, 
it's just weird. Like, it's a weird reason. I don't know. I think it sucks. Anyway, um, th and he was given the staff of mages, the most powerful artifact. <laughs> and he was like, hey, let's give it to the little kid who basically just only survived because a lich helped him. That's a good choice. This is so fucking stupid. Sorry. This is so stupid. It's ridiculous. Okay. And here's the worst part about this. I love the story. I love Raceland as a character. But this test was horrible. And it's so frustrating because I want to like the test. I want to enjoy it. But as a thinking human being, I have to throw on my critical hat and say, no, this is bad writing. The whole rest of this book which is not the reason why I bought the book, you know, back when it was released, is awesome. But this final little part of it, which is the reason everyone bought it, is the worst part about the entire book. How depressing is that? Okay. And then, Raceland isn't even given a, a master, or he's not an apprentice to anyone, but he's going to be guided by Lunatary herself. That is such a huge cop-out. Like, Antimides and Parsalian are having this conversation where they're like, look, no one wants to train him because they know that Fist and Daniels is inside him. And, and Parsalian's like, well, I happen to know that there's a god up there who has taken a great interest in this young man and will apprentice or will be his master. She's everyone's master! She's the master of every red robe! That's not special. That's not different. That's a... You're, you're literally setting up this character to fail by not giving him anyone to look up to, by just setting him loose with one of the most powerful artifacts on Kryn and a lich in his back pocket. <laughs> how do you, how do you as Parsalian go into this thinking, I need to forge me a weapon that will defeat the Queen of Darkness and let him walk out with no help at all? That's insane. <laughs> that, that is not helping anyone. That's literally doing your best to hurt them. Stupid. Okay. <laughs> this is such a strange end to the book and wildly anticlimactic. I wish the test was workshopped more. Raceland didn't use all the spells unless he only memorized two of them, and then that's really weird. And the whole narrative of the test was ham-fisted with Fist and Daniels himself. I was really let down by the original Test of the Twins short story. Then I was intrigued when I played through the Soul Forge Adventure game book. And now? The rest of this novel was infinitely better than the test. And I am not excited to reread Brothers Majira after reading this. I would absolutely recommend this novel to Dragonlance fans and fans of the Heroes of the Lance. But if you're looking for a good example of a test for the Order of High Sorcery, this book is not it. Look. I love Raceland as a complex and driven character. I love Margaret Weiss's writing in general. Inevitably, we will like some aspects of a story more than others. And my least favorite part is the ending of this novel. I'm left with a sour taste in my mouth. I didn't want it to be there. I remember loving this novel the first time I read it uh, when it was initially released. But now, I just expect more. What do you guys have to say? So... Um, Saras, thanks for joining live. Soulforge is just so good. One of your favorites. That's awesome. I'm glad you really enjoyed it. Uh, you know, Machine, there are no gods. <laughs> There's Belzor. There is only Zul. <laughs> I just, I love that scene in Ghostbusters. <laughs> like, if someone asks you if you're a god, you say yes! <laughs> um... Let's see, Marcus, it's not bad at all. You liked as it is the psychology of Raceland 101. Yeah. Uh, hey, John, thanks for joining live. A uh, long time since you caught the stream. Well, I'm glad you caught it this time. Fabulous book. I'm glad you enjoyed the book. Uh, Anthony, thanks for joining live. Kit was proud of her brothers because she saw them as a reflection of her strength. She never loved anyone except herself. I'll buy that. Um, yeah, she, that moment when she was like, when, when Raceland was taken to jail and Karen was like, we got to do something. She's like, just let him kill him. Let them kill Raceland, and then we can go off to the north and become rich, you know, as mercenaries. I know a guy. And Karaman was like, what? No. Are you crazy? 
Why would I let them kill my twin? That that is not an option in my life. And the kid was like, "Just kidding." <laughs> Jokey jokes. <laughs> Did you get it? It was funny. Anyway, yeah, I guess we could save him. <laughs> She's either so stupid that she thinks her brother is stupid enough to believe that. Well, I don't know. She, She's just insane. Like, I still can't wrap my head around why she was so willing to let him die, but then fought so hard to keep him alive in his youth. I can't, I can't justify those two. I can't wrap them around my head. Uh, as far as magic, you think we get a clear resolution during the absence of the gods when magic had to be relearned. But again, it was, um, it was wild so that it was um, um, unreliable. And the only way they could get any reliable form of magic in the Fifth Age is by sapping it from an item of magic that was made before the gods left, you know, from the pure version. So the wild sorcery was just, it was erratic, you know, and, and so it was very much a different type of magic. Um, you loved how Raceland deep down respected Sturm. See, Benjamin, I'm glad you brought that up. Thanks uh, for tuning in if I hadn't already said it yet. Um, that's something that, you know, it's always been hinted in every little story, every little scene, the Lost Chronicles especially, where Raceland and Sturm have this really challenging relationship. S you know, Sturm finally admits to Ray or to, I think it was Tika or someone, like, look, the reason why I don't like Raceland is because how he treats his brother. He he got over the whole magic thing when he was a kid, you know, like through in this novel primarily. So that wasn't what was the reason was, which was the reason we were always given. But the truth is, is he just didn't like how rude Raceland was to Karaman. Like he, Karaman was his good friend, like, like probably his best friend. Like they palled around since they were kids, you know, playing swords before they even knew how to swing one. So yeah, I, I would be pissed if my friend's older or younger brother was always making fun of him, making him feel like shit. Like that's horrible. That's toxic. So it made sense that he finally admitted why. But even as much as they contested, they always found these little moments to show respect for each other. Like, you know, as, as much as I see you as adult, as Raceland is telling Sturm, from time to time, you make a lot of sense. You know, you're right. Or, you know, it was very brave of you to stand in front of the mob that was going to go burn me at the stake, knowing that you could not have stopped them. But because it was the right thing to do, I respect you for that. Like, that's beautiful. That is so great. And we have to understand and respect those moments because, you know, when you're in the heat of an event, which these characters find themselves in their entire lives, it seems, you know, your adrenaline's running, your emotions are on dialed up to 10. Of course, you're going to be whiny and gripey and bitchy and moany and stubborn and whatever. But the truth is, these were childhood friends. And again, you don't always get along with the people that you connect with in life. But you do have a true connection with them, just like Sturm and Raceland do. And I think it's it's really beautiful. Um, his golden skin was armor in this book. Yes, Sean. It was it was explained because the, the dark elf at the top threw a light or a fireball down. And Raceland was like, oh, shit, I'm dead. <laughs> I can't survive this. And then uh, Fist and Danilus like, barks and he's like, you were saved by your armor. But as soon as your new golden skin, your armor you created... But as soon as you run out of that, I'm going to find a crack and I'm going to get in there. I was just like, what? That's, that's weird. <laughs> All right. Glad to hear you being confused too. You read the story three times at least and said each time, what? <laughs> Mark, I'm glad that I'm not alone. I can sometimes feel like I'm crazy reading these things. Um, thanks for joining live. JB, what is up? Thanks for tuning in. Uh, it might have been one of the last good Dragonlance releases. Ooh, I don't know. We've got some good ones. Have you ever read the um, Elven Exiles trilogy? It's really good. I thought it was good anyway. Kit is a sociopathic narcissist. <laughs> That's one explanation. <laughs> that is one explanation, all right. Uh, Benjamin Wright. She lets her brothers die to her knowledge in the maelstrom of the Blood Sea too. Yeah, but we gotta, we got we have to be able to reconcile Kit before she became a Dragon High Lord and after because. Life experiences up until that point. She was a mercenary, but she always returned home. She was always returning home, giving, you know, um, weapons to her brother and, you know, trying to take care of uh, Raceland. 
Like she was going out of her way to always come back and take care of them in some way. But as soon as she became a dragon high Lord, you know, as soon as they separated for those five years, she was fell into a whole new lifestyle that nothing else really mattered. You know, it was just her ambition, her goals, and she just didn't have time to return. She cared enough to send a note, which at least that's something, you know, she still cared that much, but ultimately she had a whole new life. And I would argue that if any of the other heroes found themselves in a similar circumstance, they would not have come back. If Sturm was wildly accepted with the Salamonic Knights, he wouldn't have come back. He would have been focused on arguing with Derek Crownguard about how to be a better knight. But it was because he was rejected that he came back. Tannis, he had this weird fling with like a... It's been so long since I read Tannis the Shadow Years. That I'll talk out my ass if I try to explain. Because I'm not sure I remember everything correctly. But, you know, he had some like crazy wild adventures. All of them did. But they all came back because they didn't have something that took over their lives, you know. Um... When they're separated at Tarsus, yep, right. You read it only when it was released. What you remember most is that Raceland broke, uh, Raceland's broken heart when he saw Carmen, Carmen with his crush. Explains a lot about how he handled their relationship years later. I saw it as, um, yeah, when uh, Marjorie, I think her name was, and she came on to Raceland. She she was doing that as, um, the way I read it was that she was mildly interested in Raceland because he saved so many people her sister included or their their i don't know sibling or whatever it was but it wasn't that she was you know she was the type of character that she was attracted to a lot of boys in fact she ended up marrying a boy while she was still dating caraman so she was kind of a loose <laughs> need <laughs> character who just enjoyed vital existence and there's nothing wrong with that <laughs> i dig it too as long as it's safe and consenting every time, then, you know, have fun, do whatever you want. But yeah, that was Raceland's first opportunity of being exposed to the idea of love other than magic. And he was willing to give it all up. And then to find out that she wasn't as interested in him as she, he thought she was. And then in fact, he just saw her with Caraman and then later was a little bit pleased that Caraman was all butthurt that she found someone else and married them. That was his way of rationalizing women are not as important to me as my magic. And so, you know, later in life when it was Chrysania throwing herself at him, he was like, look, I've been down this road. I don't care. You do your thing. I'll use you, but I'm not going to sleep with you. Like, it kind of reminded me of that scene in Dr. Strangelove. If you guys ever seen this movie, it's really great. Um, when uh, the general is like, I'm worried about the communists getting my, my vital fluids. And it causes him to like destroy the entire world with nuclear bombs and stuff. But that crazy line of thought, and it was actually also in um, Disturbing Behavior, <laughs> where these adults were like experimenting on kids and turning them sort of crazy. And this uh, jock who was, you know, sort of, you know, a parked car with a girl and they were going to have sex, but he like lost his mind because of this experiment and ended up killing her because he was about to come and he didn't want to um for whatever reason that's kind of raceland he's like look my bodily fluids are mine <laughs> you can't have them magic is the only thing that gets me off now you know all right you know everyone's got their own kink i'm down you know no shaman do your thing uh when raceland confronted steel about his father deep in his heart Sturm was always a knight yeah yeah, and that's what that's what I loved is that Raceland always recognized Stern for who and what he was. Everyone did. In the end, every single character did. And that's why I like Sturm so much, is that he didn't pretend to be something he's not. He just he was always a knight in his heart. And so that's who he was. You know, that's just how he rolled. Definitely thought it was brilliant how they wrote Raceland in that his personal ambitions happened to also help save the world and benefit the heroes of the lands. Um yeah, <laughs> I think, this is just my opinion, I think Raceland's saving everyone at the end of Dragons of Spring Dawning had more to do with him. Um, if Takesis came in the world, then he wouldn't be able to challenge her fully. He had to, like, he had to draw her in on his own terms 
and destroy her on his own terms. If she came in full-fledged and had control of the world, there's no way he would have been able to go back in time and become the master of past and present and then confront her and be able to defeat her. So he had to stop her from entering. But also, he didn't want any hang-ups. He, 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 he owed his current existence to everyone else helping him when he was younger. And he wanted to pay that debt so that he was debt-free and he didn't owe anyone anything. So it was less about helping them as much it was him signing checks and paying them off. You know, it was all for him. It was all for his glory. It was all for his magic. It had nothing to do with anyone else. That's how I interpreted it. Um, but I do love hearing, you know, how other people see his behavior and interpret it. Because ultimately, it's all headcanon. It's all however we read it and how we feel about it and whatever makes us comfortable, you know. That's what's important. Um... Yeah, no, you're right. It all it all works up to confronting Tachesis. All right. Well, that is really kind of all I had about this novel. Um, I loved it, loved it, loved it up until that final book in the novel. And um, I don't know what I expected because I've already read this novel before. It wasn't a surprise. It was just as I was reading it, I started having all these little questions ticking off in my head. And they, they just were never satisfied or answered effectively. And I'm kind of frustrated, you know? Like, if I never read another Raceland Majir book again, I kind of feel like I'll be happy. But the truth is, as much as I don't really want to do it, the next book I'm going to read is Brothers of Majir. And I don't even think that was a great novel, if I'm remembering right. But I'm going to read it anyway. <laughs> and I'll give you my honest review. If I'm surprised, like I was surprised with Draconian Measures and Doom Patrol, I'll let you know. I'll be honest with you. I'll tell you I loved it. If I find it lacking, then I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to tell you how I feel about it. I think ultimately what's so great about these novels is that, and this happens with everything in life, the older you get, the experiences that you have, they color your perception. And so you see things differently in most every case as an adult than you did when you were a kid and you first read them, right? And that's just experience. That's life. That's learning and growing. And that's what should happen. It's that when you ruin the stories because they no longer make sense, that that becomes a bad thing. <laughs> and like in all my memory, I was like, I love the Soul Forge. I can't wait to get back to the Soul Forge. I'm going to love giving the review of the Soul Forge. And then I do it. And I was like, ah, shit, man, <laughs> I didn't love it as much as I remember loving it. Damn. So what are you going to do? That's life, right? Thank you guys so much for tuning in live. I have so much more fun doing this when there's people bouncing thoughts off of. Um, the new trilogy is out August 2nd, I think, is when Amazon gave me a notice saying they're going to deliver it. So um, the, the second book, I think, is going to be the next year, and then probably one book a year for the three of them. Um, but yeah, the first one is the beginning of August this year. Um, oh, is it Brothers in Arms I'm thinking of? Is the second one to this? I get them mixed up because the names are so similar. But one was the Preludes and one was the sequel to the Raceland Chronicles to this. Um, anyway, the one that's the sequel to this is the next one I'm reading and reviewing. Um, so anyway, I, I really do appreciate you guys you know, taking time out of your lives to, to tune in and geek out about Dragonlance with me. It makes it a lot of fun and I really do appreciate the back and forth and stuff. Um, that is it for my review of the Soul Forge by Margot Weiss. Do you think Margot Weiss's The Soul Forge was better than the game book of the same name? Do you think that it made the test of high sorcery interesting and engaging? You can always email me at info at dlsaga.com or you can always leave a comment below if you're not joining us live in chat. I would like to take a moment and remind you to subscribe to this YouTube channel, like the video, ring the bell to get notified about the next um, upcoming videos, and all of this ultimately. It goes to let other Dragonlance fans know about this channel and the content. And again, this channel is all about celebrating the wonderful world of the Dragonlance Saga. I thank you for joining me in the celebration. My name is Adam, Dragonlance Saga, and until next time, Salon Javaro.